Analysis of Poppies by Jane Weir for the AQA GCSE Literature Exam. Poppies. Three days before Armistice Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel, crimped petals, spasms of paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled black thorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and this is where it has led me, skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf, gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. Right, using flirt, form language, imagery, rhythm rhyme, tone and subject, we are starting with subject. The poem explores uh, emotions. It's um, a poem about a mother remembering a son who has uh, gone off to fight in a war, in a conflict somewhere, and has been killed in action. So this poem is about the, the, the speaker, who is a mother, remembering her lost son. Form. Now the form and structure, we have um, four stanzas of the poem, um, but there is a non-chronological narrative structure. In other words, it doesn't follow um, time as in, uh, you know, in a natural progress, starting with A, B, C, D going on. It, it kind of jumps about a bit. Uh, there is use of the past and present tense. After you'd gone, this is where it has led me. And there are the first and second person pronouns. You, I, me, etc. So analysing this, the structure, the narrative structure, being non-chronological, shows how the speaker, the mother, is remembering past events when her son was alive, and her memory is kind of switching back and forth from from uh, different time time frames. It's going from the present when she's uh, about to go to the memorial, but then it goes back to his uh, her last memory of her, of him. Sorry, her last memory of him. Um, as he leaves the house for the last time, leaves the home for the last time to go off um, to fight. Um, and But even within that memory, she remembers times of when he was a child, when he was a young boy, the, you know, the rubbing the nose, the Eskimos, etc., etc. Um, and this shift in time reflects the different ways in which she is remembering and, you know, the different ways in which she is grieving for her son. The first and second person pronouns convey the speaker, the mother, is directly addressing her son and uh, uh, by doing so she's trying to make a connection and therefore trying to keep his memory alive by keeping that connection there. Now the language. There's some military language uh, we see in the poem blockade, reinforcements, um, and there are metaphors that suggest conflict, 
Okay, disrupting a blockade. That's the um, the color of red that is disrupting the the yellow bias that's going around his blazer. But disrupting a blockade. That's a that's a metaphor again, suggesting conflict. The sellotape is bandaged around the hand. You know, she's wound it around her hand to pick out the cat hair off the blazer. Um, but she's used the 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 phrase, the metaphor, bandaged. There is also language that evokes color and texture. Uh, particularly the crimped petals, the yellow bias, and there's lots of uh, sewing language as well with the uh, and material, uh, you know, tuck starts, pleats, hatless, um, and the the ornamental stitch that we see in the later stanzas. So really, uh, you know, giving a sense of of texture there. So the metaphors used by the speaker are showing how the mother, while she is remembering. Um, trying to remember um, her son being alive, she cannot escape from uh, an implied an implied violent death that her son has suffered. Um, you know, one makes an assumption that he has died in conflict and therefore it would be a violent death. Um, but there are also hints within um, with the, the spasms of red, uh, paper red and the, you know, the bandaged, um, the, the cell they bandaged etc it, it does suggest a, a kind of um, a, a violent death and her memories enable her to maintain a connection with her son but she is unable to avoid she is unable to escape thinking about his injuries and his uh, ultimate death the colors and texture in the poem particularly in the first stanza um, kind of reflect that the finer details that she is remembering and um, she's she's picking out the smaller points and uh, this just shows how her memories are, are made vivid they're made more clear more real more uh, more immediate uh, through her grief and her sense of loss so imagery again we have spasms of paper red there that we looked at with the language as well um, now the red of the poppy I think it suggests it could suggest a wound. It's a, 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 an image of remembrance, but um, the image, the the look, the physical look, the literal look of a poppy, be it paper or the the real thing, suggests um, a wound. There are images: the the playing Eskimos um, and the the uh, the cat hairs on the blazer. You know, the idea of uh, uh, of, of cuddling the cat and getting the cat's cat hairs all over uh, the blazer. These are childlike innocent images of childlike innocence um, and the metaphor of the songbird show uh, two things I think the letting go of the son and also the mother letting go of her emotions uh, and then finally we have this dove image that pulled freely against the sky and uh, dove uh, is um, uh, an image of peace Okay, so with this image of the poppy in the first stanza, we see quite clearly that this is a poem about remembrance. We are remembering the fallen soldiers, we are remembering the war dead, the, the people that have made the ultimate sacrifice for their country. So starting the poem um, with this image, this image of colour, but this, this image, this key image, um, of a poppy shows that this is a, this poem is about remembrance um, but as well as being a symbol of remembrance it is also a symbol of conflict of conflict symbol of conflict another typo I'll have to go back and correct um, the shape and the color if you think about it there's the uh, with the uh, poppy there's the black circular central uh, you know there's kind of concentric circles as well, a circle within a circle there's the black inner circle and then the red on the outside um, it can I think possibly you might want to argue with me on here but it suggests a wound a bullet wound um, and I think uh, having that word spasms as well as the spasms of paper red um, really do uh, reinforce that hint that uh, it, it suggests the the son's fatal injuries. The second stanza, the mother, the speaker, is re remembering her ch son's childhood with fondness. Uh, but 
you know, a particular moment. Um, and we, we have this image of a mother looking after her son. This whole stanza is about her looking after um, her son, picking out the cat hair of, of his blazer. And that's not from his childhood. That's before he, he has gone off um, uh, to, to war. Uh, that's before he left for the last time. But still, she is looking after him. Then she remembers within that memory... Um, of how she wanted to um, to play Eskimos, rub the noses together again, um, thinking about him as a child. Um, and then, look, you know, she wants to run her fingers through. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled black thorns of your hair. A metaphor there in that she wants to kind of uh, mother him, so to speak, um, and... Uh, you know, boys, as you, as you all know, the, the older you grow, the less attention you want from your mother, as it were. And, and the, the, the black thorns of your hair um, is a metaphor um, highlighting his prickly response to it. You know, leave me alone, mum. I'm OK. I'm, you know, I'm going now. Um, so with these memories, there provides a contrast um, in the poem of the, the, the son as a child and the sun as a man. The songbird. It's a metaphor, as I've said. She releases a songbird. Um, now, there's a, a, a theme throughout this poem of, of bravery, of bravery. And when we think of the um, uh, conflict and we think of bravery, we think immediately of those people that are involved directly in the war, but we um, should also think about those that are not involved directly, but indirectly, the families that are left behind. They have to be brave too. And here the speaker, the mother, wants to be strong while saying goodbye. She doesn't want to break down. She doesn't want to cry. She doesn't want to make it a sad um, uh, or, you know, any worse than it already is. Um, but once she is gone, she goes up to his bedroom and breaks down, uh, released a songbird from its cage. However, the metaphor may also imply she is letting go of her child. Remember we talked about how birds um, and flight and so forth um, are a good symbol or, a, or you know, almost a cliched symbol in poetry of freedom, of liberty, and here she's letting go of her child. So she's letting go of her emotions and letting go of her child. So we're picking out one image, one metaphor, and we're saying more than one thing about it. We're saying a couple of things about it, which the examiners will want to see. Um, her emotional contra uh, response, as you can see, is contrasted with the sun. He leaves intoxicated. The world, the open door that opens up onto the, to the world is like a, a treasure chest to him. So he is excited. He is, uh, um, uh, you know, exhilarated by leaving and, and going to war. This is what he is, uh, um, he's built himself up for. Yet she is sad because she is losing her son. Um, of course, at the time, she didn't know she was losing him forever, but she is losing her, her, her baby boy, is, is grown up and, and leaving. And it's an emotional time for a parent, any parent, but particularly a mother. Now, with the rhythm and the rhyme, you will see there's no regular meter. Now, if you um, have looked at the uh, my previous videos, I think it was Belfast Confetti I first mentioned meter. Meter is uh, the poetic term we use to describe the rhythmic pattern. Um, so there's no regular meter. So if you look at the lines, um, they are not all of the same length in terms of their syllables, um, and the, the you know there's no poetic feat as as such. Um, I'm, I don't really need to go into poetic feat um, right now, but there's there's no uniform rhythmic pattern, nor is there a rhyme scheme. There is, however, frequent caesuras. And I will explain that. Um, and these two uh, lines that I have given you as quotations have got caesuras in them. Okay, so the caesuras, they are breaks in the rhythm. You should be aware of that poetic term. <clears throat> and if you're going to explore this poem um, in the exam, when you get on to, or if you're going to write about rhythm, I would talk about the caesuras. OK, because the, the speaker is trying to be strong. She's trying to maintain uh, calm. She's trying to be controlled. However, these breaks in the rhythm, um, either full stops or commas or, uh, you know, little um, 
uh, embedded clauses within a line, they break up the flow. And if you go back and listen to me reading, uh, you know, when you read a poem, you don't just stop at the end of a line. You still look at punctuation. OK, so you don't. Um, and when I say you don't stop at the end of the line, you don't pause at the end of the line, which is a common mistake. Um, so it's three days before Armistice Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. That's the first three lines. And I've stopped at the full stop. There are the first two lines have enjambement, they flow into the next. However, that full stop comes in the middle of a line, and then it's before you left, comma, I pinned one onto your uh, lapel. So these breaks in the rhythm show how, whilst the speaker is trying to be controlled, she can't let her um, emotions um, break through. She can't stop them from breaking through. Now, the tone. Um, you may have noticed the the line the poem starts in the first line with a link to the First World War to Armistice Stun Sunday. As I've said already, there is a sense of bravery in in the speaker. So the, the you know there's always we we have this respect for the speaker because they are they have to be brave. However, I think ultimately the the poem is is one that is sad, it's somber and and mournful. Obviously, the uh, the speaker is sad and mournful but I think we as readers uh, are also um, uh, share those emotions empathize with those emotions um, and and not just because of the loss of one person so this link to Armistice Sunday at the beginning shows how long we have been using poppies as remembrance almost a hundred years now um, next year will be the centenary of the start of uh, the First World War and 2018 which is what, five years away will be the um, the centenary of its end okay of, of the first Armistice Sunday um, and then from uh, after the Great War the First World War poppies became a symbol of remembrance because they grew in the fields of Belgium where um, you know the Western Front most of the, the conflict um, uh, in the Western Front was taking place. Now, um, because it starts with Armistice Sunday, I think there's a there's a hint of regret um, and sadness that you know the we are still wearing them. We we no longer just wear them for those that lost their lives in the First World War. It's all wars, um, certainly all wars from the the twentieth century. So the First World War, Second World War, the Korean War, uh, the Falklands War, the Gulf Wars. Um, and now uh, what's going on in Afghanistan and I Iraq and so forth, we are still wearing these poppies um, as a remembrance for because there are still young men making this ultimate sacrifice. And I think that link um, s suggests this regret that this is still the case. The theme of bravery, as I mentioned earlier, not only does that... Uh, connect with those that are making the ultimate sacrifice and fighting uh, for their country but also for those um, who are affected indirectly by conflict and by war those that are left behind they have to be brave because they're waiting for the return of loved ones or they have to be brave because they are facing um, the loss of a, a, a son um, a father, an uncle, brother, nephew, a, a wife, a mother, you know, there are um, women who are making the uh, ultimate sacrifice for our country as well. Now in the last stanza, I think this mournful tone uh, is, is emphasised because uh, the poet reminds us that um, there are many names inscribed on the war memorials. I traced uh, the line is, I trace the inscriptions on the war memorial. Um, so we are reminded that there are many. This is a poem that uh, specifically is about the loss of one person. But through reading it, we are remembering the many that have sacrificed their, their lives for our country. You know, not just this country, um, but, you know, the lives... Uh, of all armies across the world that have uh, made the ultimate sacrifice for something that they have believed in.